All righty, let's get started. We're rocking and rolling throughout the semester. We're in week four, so probably some of you have already had your, uh, your first exams. Of course, we don't have exams in college. We have celebrations of learning, so you probably are celebrating in some of your classes already, but hopefully those are going well. Um, a few quick announcements. We're going to keep on rolling with the, the quiz schedule. So the quiz uh, for today's lecture uh, will uh, uh, open up Saturday 8 a.m. and will close next Friday at 11 a.m. So just make sure you're getting those quizzes done on time. Uh, I thought I would also mention uh, Marshall's Career Expo, which is coming up soon. Uh, it's going to be in the Rec Center, and it's on October 8th from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. So if you have time... Uh, uh, if, if your class schedule permits, you might want to go and check it out. Uh, also, uh, it might seem like it's a little early because it's not for a couple weeks, but considering that it's a career expo, if you're interested in going, uh, it might be a good idea to begin polishing your resume because there are folks that might be asking for it. So I just wanted to throw that out there in case you're interested. Sound good? All right. So we're going to uh, keep on trucking today. We've got a, a faculty presentation, and your main speaker is actually me. I'm going to work for a living today. Um, but uh, we're going to keep along with the same pattern. Uh, your faculty who's going to introduce himself uh, this week is uh, Dr. Yusuf Sardahi, one of our mechanical faculty. He's going to tell you a little bit about what he does here at Marshall. So let's give him a warm welcome. Yeah, my hand is sweating. I've been lecturing since 8 in the morning. Ooh. Yeah. Here, yeah. you hold that, okay. and you hold that, and I'll get you loaded right back. Okay, guys. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Greg, for the nice introduction. Uh, this is me, Yusuf Sardahi. You can find me. Uh, this is my office number. I'm Dr. Greg uh, Nyber. Uh, in office uh, 2225. I made a mistake here. Okay. I wrote this slide very quick. Okay. Um, this is my email if you want to contact me about one of the topics that I will cover today. So at the beginning, let me just give you a very uh, a quick uh, background about myself. Um, I graduated in 2000, uh, in 2007, uh, in two, uh, 2007, okay, from Jordan University. Um, I received a bachelor in mechatronics engineering, and after that, uh, I decided I decided to pursue a mechatronics uh, master degree also in a mechatronics engineering. So I went to uh, Jordan University of Science and Technology, and I graduated from there in 2011. After that, I started thinking about coming to the United States and doing my PhD here. I contacted many universities, many pro professors, some of them. I may have responded, some of them took a long time to respond, and some, by the way, responded in less than three minutes. Okay? So I applied for three different universities, um, University of California in Merced, Binghamton University in New York, and uh, Denver um, University in Denver, Colorado. Um, I got accepted by these three universities, but um, I got um, a financial support from University of California in Merced, and I went there. Um, I started my PhD program in 2016, in, 20, uh, in 2012, and I graduated in 2016. After I graduated from University of California, um, Merced, I worked there for about one year as a lecturer in the mechanical engineering department. And in uh, August 17, 2017, uh, I joined Marshall, uh, Marshall University as a, an assistant professor in the mechanical engineering department. Um, um, I teach uh, courses related to um, programming and also related to mechanical engineering, uh, such as engineering one, elephant, uh, engineering computation. I taught this course two times. So you might um, find me, I mean, when you take this course. For the mechanical engineering students, we change this course into ME1 Elephant. This course will be offered next uh, semester. I also teach uh, courses related to control because this is related to my research and my area of expertise. So I teach uh, instrumentation and control. We change this course into control systems. So we mainly focus on control system design and also BLC programming. Um, I teach also some labs like mechanical engineering lab, um, um, one of the courses also that I taught in Marshall University, the mechatronics course. I'm going to talk today also about some of the projects that we did in this course. I'm going to share uh, some of the ideas with you. Um, I teach also some of the graduate courses related to my field, such as automation and control. 
university is an advanced ecosystem course, uh, also system modeling and advanced vibration course. I taught this course only one, one time when I joined Marshall for the first time. This course will be offered next semester for graduate students. As I say, courses are graduate, uh, graduated courses. Okay. Um, my research, my research is mainly about two things. It's, uh, it's about something called multi-objective optimization and control system. So my main area of expertise is actually control system design, and then I do something called multi-objective optimization. Today I'm going to try to explain to you uh, what I mean by multi-objective optimization. I usually try to use a very simple examples so that you understand what I mean by this kind of of, of optimization. I think some of you guys are familiar with this concept of optimization. Maybe you studied this in calculus, maybe in the high school, maybe in calculus one. So when you have a function, you need to minimize that function, right, to get the global minimum or the global maximum. In case of multi-objective optimization, I think as the name suggests, uh, you can notice that we have more than one objective that we need to deal with at the same time, okay? In the case of single objective optimization, when you have only one one, one, one objective to either maximize or minimize, you usually uh, end up having only one solution. So I'm, I'm going to give you a very simple example. I usually use this example because it's very easy to understand the concept. If you guys want to buy a car, how many objectives usually you are going to have in your head? What is the first thing that comes to your head? Especially you are students and you are not making too much money. The cost, right? That's the first objective. What is the second objective that you may have in your mind? Maybe how, I mean, um, how comfort is the car, right? Or the comfort features that you have inside the car, especially if you are a family man, you need a big car, right? So that can be the second objective. You can add to the list, okay? So if you have too much money, for example, you can uh, also, um, Include the performance, you can add it to the list, okay? Um, if you are a manufacturer and you want to make a car, you might include other objectives like, for example, fuel uh, consumption. If you live in a state that care a lot about pollution, you might, for example, add another uh, objective like, for example, emission of pollutants, okay? So you can notice that we are dealing with a problem that has one more than one objective at the same time. And we need to optimize these two or four or five objectives at the same time, okay? So let, let's only take two of them, okay? Let's, for example, take the cost and take the comfort. So the comfort, for example, you can, you can for example, take the car suspension system as one of the features of the comfort, okay? Maybe you need the suspension system to be very, very nice. So when you drive in a pumpy road, you don't feel I mean the vibration while you are driving, okay? So let's take these two objectives and see how the relationship between these two, okay? So if you wanna, if you care about costs and if you, love, uh, if you live here in the United States, maybe the cheapest car that you can find in the market is Nissan Versa. That one is the cheapest car in the United States. It costs you only 12,000 12, brand new, okay? But, um, I mean, other features maybe that you are interested in like comfort or performance or fuel consumption is not there. Maybe it's good in fuel consumption, okay, but other stuff like, for example, uh, comfort if you want, when you sit the, on, the, on the car seat, uh, uh, that feeling maybe it's not there. When you drive it on a bumpy road, for example, you might feel vibration um, coming from the road to your body, something like that, okay? Now, if, if, if you have a lot of money, okay, not a lot of money, if you have a very good amount of money, for example, you might, interested, you might be interested in Mercedes-Benz. This one costs about, I think, about $100,000, okay? So between these two, between these two cars, you can find a lot of cars in the market, right? Okay? So you have Toyota Camry, you have Lexus, a lot of options, okay? And this is the point that I want to make about multi-objective optimization. When you have more than one objective, that you want to minimize at the same time, usually the solution is not a single point. It's not only Nissan Versa, it's not only Mercedes-Benz. It's usually more than one option at the same time, okay? These different options, these different solutions for, for this multi-objective optimization problem represent different uh, trade-offs between the objective functions that you are trying to minimize. So this is the main idea about multi-objective optimization. It's like you have more than one objective that you need to achieve at the same time, and you, the solution is more than one point. It's more than one option, okay? Is it clear, guys? Okay? Okay, 
Now, l let me share with you some of the projects that my students um, uh, conducted in one of my classes, in the mechatronics class, okay? So a mechatronics class, usually we have, let's say, mechatronics students. So we have students from different departments, from electrical engineering students, uh, some, um, uh, I mean, some students from the electrical engineering department and other students from mechanical engineering. So I usually mix them. Okay, because the projects are a mechatronics project. So it involves, this project involves expertise from both fields. Uh, for example, this, this, this project here, Flying Drone, I had a group of students, about three students from mechanical engineering department, about two students from mechanical engineering department. And the students were trying to model the drone, do some kind of parameter identification, and uh, also um, eventually, they should be able to do something like attitude stabilization. So we ask them first to do something called, uh, something called modeling. And the concept is, uh, of modeling, guys, you are going to do that maybe in some of the courses. Modeling simply means how to bring the system into the computer, right? By representing the system by either mathematical equation or using some computer-aided um, softwares like, for example, CAD or uh, solid work or pro e or something like that okay so in this course we ask them to do modeling we, we, we ask them also to do something called parameter identification so sometimes when you do um, I mean modeling you end up having some of the parameters that you don't know so how can you find them we find them uh, by using a method called uh, parameter identification all of these groups okay that um, we had in the in the mechatronics uh, class, we, you can call them mechatronics groups because they have uh, students from two different departments. This is also another project that the students worked on because we live in an area that has a lot of mines. Some of students were interested in this project by building something called um, Arduino-based intelligent uh, Hamlet 4 for coal miners. Okay. This, this project has a lot of sensors because students need to measure, for example, uh, if there is a dangerous gas in the environment where the miners are working. If there is, for example, if the, the environment is very noisy, so they should have a sensor that measures the noise, for example, a sound sensor or something like that. They should, should be able also to um, measure some of the biological parameters of the miner, like, for example, its temperature, its heart rate, and something like that, and send all of this uh, information into a ground um, station. Um, the last project, uh, or one of the projects in this course, was just a control of a robotic car. Okay, so in this course also we have um, students from two different majors, and uh, students um, were trying to control these cars um, by using gesture control. Okay, so you can notice here that here we have a glove in this glove. We have an Arduino Nano because the glove is very small, okay, so we needed uh, a, a small uh, controller, so we, we used Arduino Nano. There is here a sensor that measures uh, rotation and also translation about three axes. We call it MPU605. Uh, there is also a wireless communication be, be between the control system in the glove and also the control system on the, on the, on the car. So if you take a mechatronics class uh, someday with me, if you are a mechanical engineer, um, we expect to work on projects like this, a project that involves um, expertise from both mechanical and electrical. And by the way, this is the concept of, of mechatronics. If you are a mechatronics engineer, then you should have a very good background about mechanical engineering concepts and also electrical and also some uh, control concepts. Okay, that's all. Thank you so much. Any question? Well, like you said, you can find him in the engineering building, 2225, right next to me. Uh, you got, you got to drop by and, and see him sometime. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, let me get this clipped on. All right. So like I said, uh, I'm going to be speaking to you today, so I get to work for a living. Um, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about uh, something that's kind of been brought up uh, here and there by some of our speakers. You know, we had uh, Sean Carter and Simon Fett from the Corps. We had, um, we had Doug Kirk from the DOH. Uh, I've spoken here. Dr. Waite's spoken here. And there's something that's in common with all of us. We all have our professional engineer's license. I'm licensed to practice engineering in the state of West Virginia, as are uh, many of our speakers. And I want to talk to you about that licensure process. Um, the thing about getting your PE license is that dependent upon your field 
it may not feel that it's necessary. There are many engineers who have been practicing throughout their entire careers and never bothered to go through getting their professional engineer's license. And so for some, for some folks, it's sort of a, a convincing step, like why should you have to do this? Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, if you're a civil engineer, many times it's required. Um, Any time you're designing something in the public sector, like a road or a bridge, and I'm a bridge engineer, uh, any of those bridges must be uh, signed off by a professional engineer. So if you're a civil engineer, it, it's very, very common. I know for some of you mechanicals and electricals, you may feel later on that you might not need to. So I want to talk about why you should really think about getting your license, and then I want to talk about how you would go, go about it. So first off, why get licensed? Okay. Now, the, uh, the process to, to getting your license is a step-by-step -step process, and that first step involves taking what's called the FE exam. And even if you're not thinking about getting licensed, you should really heavily consider at least taking the FE. Now, why should you go about doing that? Why should you waste your time? Okay, first off, money. Okay, uh, folks with licenses generally make more money because they can carry more responsibility. I like money. I'm sure you do too. I mean, one of the reasons you're in college is to ultimately get a job practicing this field, and you'd like to make money. So I think that's a very important point. Um, another thing about engineering license is it gives you flexibility, okay? If you do not have your PE license, there will be jobs that you can't get, that you can't do, period, okay? So having a PE license will grant you the ability and grant you more flexibility uh, to get different jobs. It also gives you unique qualifications, and I say this especially for uh, undergraduates who pass their FE. When you pass your FE, you're able to put on your resume, hey, I passed the FE in October 2020 or what have you. And what happens is if I'm HR or if I'm an engineering manager and I need to hire some staff engineers uh, for the next year, I'm going to look at my resumes and I'm going to see this person that's passed their FE and I'm going to put them in this pile. And that person who didn't pass their FE, I'm going to put them over here. Okay? And so being able to put that on your resume shows that you've met the standard. Okay? It's an experience that every engineering student across the country goes through, and it's the same experience for all of us. So showing that you've met that standard, it, it, it adds to your professional repertoire. Um, it gives you job security. Um, if Marshall University burned to the ground, I'd have a job because I'm a licensed professional engineer, and there will always be a need for licensed professional engineers. Um, it also carries with it some prestige. I mean, I'm a board-registered professional engineer. The, the state of West Virginia has entrusted uh, to me the safety, health, and welfare of the general public. Okay? And so going through that process means that the state has entrusted you with that same burden. So it carries with it some prestige. So I really think you should heavily uh, consider going towards that. Um, now I'm going to talk about the licensure process. A couple caveats before I go into this. Um, first off, I'm talking about the licensure process in the state of West Virginia. Um, engineers are licensed on a state-by-state -state basis, so the process might be a little different in Ohio or Kentucky or Nevada or, or all the other states uh, in the country, but by and large, the process is very similar from state to state. <coughs> Another thing, I'm making this presentation on September 20th, 2019. Things could change you know, by the time you go through your process. Most of it won't, but there are a couple details which might change as you start to get towards the EI and the PE steps of your license, and I'm going to mention some of those uh, in the presentation. Also, um, you know, again, any questions that you have, you can ask me, and you can also just contact the folks at the board. I mean, they're the ones who are going to have the, the final say in all of this. So um, with that, I'm going to go into the process, and I'm going to relate this process to a licensure process that just about every single person in this room is familiar with because just about every single person in this room has gone through a licensure process and that's getting a license to do what? Drive. To drive, right? Every, you know, just about everybody in this room has a driver's license. Now let's talk about that process. How do you get a driver's license? Well, it starts out, you take a test, you go to the DMV, you take a test, you pay some amount of money and they give you what? A learner's permit, right? You get a learner's permit, then what do you do? You take that learner's permit and you have to use it, right? You have to accrue so many hours of driving experience. And there are exceptions to that. You have to be with a licensed driver in the vehicle, right? And I think they have to be over 21 or something like that. Um, and then once you accrue that experience, you then take the second exam, the actual driver's uh, uh, test. And that exam is a little different. It's much more practice-based. You, you actually have to drive a car during, that, license, during that, that second licensure step. 
You pass that test, you pay a fee, boom, you got a driver's license, right? That's the step-by-step -step process to get a driver's license. To get your uh, professional engineer's license, it's very, very similar, okay? So here's the step-by-step -step process. Um, you get an ABET accredited engineering degree. Everybody in here is already on their way, so you don't have to worry about that. The first thing that you have to do after that is you take what's called the FE exam. Think of the FE exam as kind of like the test to get your learner's permit. And when I say learner's permit, what I'm talking about is EI status, stands for engineering intern status. That engineering intern status is sort of like your learner's permit. It allows you to practice engineering under the direct supervision of a PE. Then you have to use that status. You have to accrue four years of relevant experience. I'm going to talk about each of these in significant detail. Once you get that relevant experience, you then apply to take the real test, the, the practice-based test. We call that the Principles and Practice of Engineering exam or the PE exam. You pass that exam, boom, you're a PE. Okay? And so that's the step-by-step -step process. And don't worry, each of these steps I'm going to go through in very significant detail. Okay? So first off, let's talk about the preliminary steps, 1A and 1B. The first step is to get an ABET accredited uh, degree in engineering, and you all are already on your way there. Now, I know that will probably raise some questions like, well, what if the degree is not accredited yet? What if we're you know, still working towards that? First off, for you electricals in the room, it won't be an issue because you don't usually take this exam until around your senior year, and by then, <clears throat> this will be long past. We had some mechanical engineering uh, students a while back who took the FE exam and passed it, and the only thing that, that happened with them is they just had to wait a little bit to get their EI status. Once our mechanical program was accredited, they applied for EI status, and everything was, uh, was hunky-dory. Now, once you, uh, uh, so you get your uh, degree. While you're uh, taking your degree, while you're, you're getting your undergraduate degree, you need to register and take the FE exam. Now, the FE exam is written by an organization called the National Council of Examiners for Engineers and Surveyors. I abbreviate that NCEES. Uh, the, these terms I'm throwing at you, I'm throwing at you for a particular reason because NCES is, if you go to NCES.org, that's the website where you go to register for the exam uh, and whatnot. So I'm throwing that, that information out to you because you kind of need it. Um, one of the nice things about these tests, about the exam and the PE exam, is that they're national exams. The licensure process might be state by state, but it's the same test everywhere. So when you take the FE exam and pass it, it's recognized across the country. So once you take that, you'll never have to take the FE again. You know, like if you get a job in Hawaii, you don't have to take the FE again. You just have to apply, do the paperwork uh, in Hawaii. So that's steps 1A and 1B. Um, once you pass the FE, you then have to actually apply to get your EI certification. So the driver's license analogy is taking your learner's permit test and then actually filling out the paperwork and writing the check to actually get your learner's permit. There's a difference, okay? Um, there's a difference between those two. And um, <coughs> so in the state of West Virginia, um, uh, we apply uh, to the West Virginia PE Board. Uh, it's, the actual full name is the West Virginia State Board of Registration for Professional Engineers. Their website is right here. It's just westvirginiapebd.org. All of the paperwork to apply for your EI status uh, is there. I'm going to talk to you about that uh, here in a second. Once you apply, uh, once you fill all that paperwork out and pay your fees and pass your exams, uh, you're referred to as an engineering intern. So, for instance, if you see my email you know, signature, I'll say Gregory K. Michelson, and I'll say PhD, that means I have a doctorate, and I'll say PE, that means I have a professional engineer's license. Once you get that status, you'll be able to put, you know, uh, uh, John Smith EI. You'll be able to put that at the end of your name. Some states call it EIT. It stands for Engineer and Training. In fact, the FE exam used to be called the EIT exam. Now it's called the FE. So that's just a little verbiage for you for later. Now, t once you pass your FE exam, uh, in order to apply for your, your EI certification, you need a few things. The application that you fill out, you need to get it notarized. Um, most banks will do notarization for free, uh, so that, that's pretty straightforward. You do have to include a passport-like photograph in your application, but you can go to a place like CVS or Walgreens or somewhere like that, and they'll, they'll do passport-like photos for you. Uh, it's a $25 application fee. You have to include a copy that you pass the exam. Uh, you need official transcripts from Marshall. You can't just print them off of Degree Works or something like that. You have to actually have the registrar get official transcripts in a sealed envelope. 
And then you need three reference forms. Okay, this is what the reference form looks like. Um, your references can pretty much be anybody, but it's, it's suggested that they're folks who can speak to your background and qualifications. It is very, very common for professors to be uh, EI references. Usually at the end of every semester, I'm filling out a, a bunch of these things. Okay, And so most of your professors would be happy to do this. Now, when you're getting your EI certification, your references do not have to be licensed. Sometimes you'll hear people say they do not have to have their stamp. When you get your license, you get an actual stamp that you use to stamp drawing. So if you ever hear somebody say, have your stamp, that means have your license. So uh, when you're applying for your EI certification, your references do not need to be licensed. But when you're applying for the PE, some of them do. And I'll explain that here in a second. OK, <coughs> so you get your degree. Pass your FE, fill out the paperwork, you get your EI. Now what? Now you have to use that EI. Remember, you get your learner's permit, and then you have to accrue so many hours. Well, you get your EI certification, you have to work so many years. In the state of West Virginia, and in most states, that's four years of experience. Okay. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. Okay, um, If you decide to go get a master's degree, that takes a year off, so you would only have to get three years. And if you decide to get a doctorate, that takes another year off. So if you went and got your PhD, you would only need to work two years uh, in order to get your license. Now, as for what it means to, what, what do I mean by work experience or relevant work experience? So this comes straight from the board. I'm going to read this out. Um, the applicant's experience on engineering projects shall be broad in scope in his or her branch or discipline and progressive in that it was of increasing quality and required greater responsibility. Also, that experience has to be under the supervision of a registered professional engineer. There are a couple case-by-case -case caveats and whatnot, but a, a couple things about this. It is very, very common for uh, engineering students to graduate. Uh, and, you know, let's say you, you go practice and you're in management, like you're doing project management. Um, sometimes it's really tough to say that that was engineering, because if all you're doing is project management, that might not exactly be engineering. So you actually kind of need to be doing design and doing calculations and computations and whatnot. Um, sometimes if that management required, you know, the knowledge of engineering, you can sort of make that on a case-by-case -case basis, but that's totally up to the board. Basically, the long and short of it is you need to be doing actual engineering, and you need to be under the supervision of a PE. If not, you, you can explain to the board, and maybe the board can consider that experience acceptable, but otherwise, that's the general rule. <coughs> Once you accrue that experience, you apply to take your PE exam. The application is very similar, but it's a lot bigger. Okay. The reason it's bigger is because instead of three references, you need five. And of those five references for your PE exam, three of them have to have their license. Okay. So you, hopefully, you know, by that time, you're developing a professional network. You're working with folks that can speak to your technical, or technical background and your character and whatnot. So you need three licensed professional engineers. You also have to include documentation from your employers verified by their supervisors. So it's one general piece of advice, don't burn any bridges like you're working at a firm for two years and somebody ticks you off and you flip the desk over and you say, oh, I'm out of here, you know. And then two years later, like, I need you to verify my work experience so I can get my license. So don't, don't do that, you know. Don't, don't burn any bridges, okay. <coughs> now let's talk about the PE exam. The PE exam is a practice-based exam. Well, the way it works now, so I took my PE exam, I'm a civil engineer, I took the uh, civil engineering exam, and in civil engineering, just as in all of these disciplines here on the, on the screen, you have to pick a specialty, okay? So for me, I'm a structural engineer. So my morning exam was general civil engineering, and then my afternoon exam was just structures, okay? Because I, I'm a structural engineer, so that's what I picked. And so if you're a civil engineer, you have five options. You have construction, you have geotech, we have structural engineering, transportation engineering, and water resources and environmental. Those are the five areas within civil engineering that you have. If you're a mechanical engineer, you've got three options. HVAC and refrigeration, machine design and materials, or thermal and fluid systems. And if you're an electrical engineer, you have computer engineering, you have electronics, controls, and communications, and then power. Okay, those are the three areas for electrical. And so like I said, it's a morning 
uh, what we, the way we sort of refer to it is the morning is the breadth section and the afternoon is the depth section. So the morning, so instance, if you're an electrical engineer, all the electrical engineers take the same morning exam and then the afternoon is going to be one of these three areas, whichever one you pick. So for instance, if you're an electrical engineer and you've been working at AEP for four years, you would probably pick the power exam because that is relevant based on what you have done uh, in your career. Okay. Now, <laughs> right now, the PE is a paper-based exam, sort of like, a, like an SAT or whatnot where you take it on, you know, on, uh, you know, fill out the little bubble answer sheet uh, and whatnot. But uh, NCES is transitioning everything to a computer-based exam. So by the time you take the PE, which you all are set to like, graduate in the 2023 time frame, so you probably wouldn't be taking your PE until like 2027. That'd be a little bit down the road. So by then, this is probably all going to be computer-based exams. So mechanical set to go next year, electrical the year after. Civil takes a little while. Civil has a lot of references, and so that's sort of what makes it take so long. OK, does anybody have any questions about the general process? Yes, sir. That is a great question, and I'm going to, there, there's, let me say this, there's a lot of points related to that, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that. The short answer is that there's a process called comedy and reciprocity that's kind of akin to what you would hope would happen with a driver's license. Like if you got your driver's license in West Virginia and you moved to Nevada, you wouldn't want to take the test again, right? You just want to fill out some paperwork, pay your you know, whatever fee and get your license. And by and large, that process works as well. There are some things that you need to be aware of, and that's going to become clear here in a second. So I, I will cover that. Yes, sir? Uh, does, does the uh, PE expire? That's a good question as well. So does the PE exam expire? You have to renew your PE every so often. Uh, in the state of West Virginia, we're on a uh, biennial cycle. We renew every two years. So if you look at any active engineer in the state of West Virginia, it says that their license will expire December 31st of 2020 because we're on even cycles. So around the December time frame, you'll just renew your license and claim your continuing ed and just go on and so, so on and so forth. Yes, sir? When do I suggest you take the FE? That's a great question. I suggest that you take it your senior year, and I would... My strong suggestion is that you would take it before the end of your first semester. The reason why is because when you're applying for jobs, you want it on there that you passed. So that, that would be my advice. What I don't want to have happen is, oh, I'll put it off till next semester. Oh, I'll put it off. And the next thing you know, you got married, you're buying a house, you're having kids, and then you've been in, the next thing you know, you're 36 years old, you never bothered to get it, and then you've forgotten all this calculus stuff. One more. Yes, sir. To the work experience? Unfortunately, no. The work experience clock in the state of West Virginia starts the day you graduate. That, that's not to say that work experience isn't valuable. It just doesn't count towards your license. So. Is your PE exam, is it like one and done? Once you pass it, you don't have to take it like every senior year? No, you don't have to take it again. But as long as you follow certain processes, and that's going to become clear here in a second. Don't worry. Uh, i got one more, and then I, I've got a few more things I want to discuss. You, did you have a question? Yes. Yes, that is correct. All you do is, so when, when I applied for mine, I just said, I got my master's year of experience and just gave my transcripts. So, yep, that's all I did. All right, I'm going to get, there's, I, I, probably you all have a lot more questions, and some of those questions might be answered as I, as I go through some of this. Um, let me talk about the FE exam. So again, the FE exam is a nationally administered exam. You take the same exam in West Virginia as they do in Oregon and, and California and Maine and Nevada and everywhere. It's the same exam. So every, recognize, every licensing body in the, in the country recognizes the FE. Once you take the FE and you pass it, you, you know, you're good. Now, one piece of advice, you know, nowadays you're, you're registering for everything online, and NCES is the organization that maintains that record, so don't lose your login and your password and all of that. Make sure that you keep up with all of that. 
Now, in West Virginia, you, if you fail the exam more than three times, you're required to submit this educational plan of study. They want to see like what you're going to do differently uh, in order to pass it. Um, there are some folks who are like, well, I'll just take it once to see how it is, and the next time I'll take it for real. If you're going to take the exam, take it seriously, and, and you know, do, it, do it the first time, do it right, and be done with it. That's sort of my opinion. Um, comedy reciprocity, this is um, uh, what I was talking about earlier. So if you're licensed in another state and you move and you want to be licensed in, um, uh, in, if you're licensed in state A and you want to be licensed in state B, Normally what you would like to do is just file some paperwork, pay your fees, uh, and be good. I'm a bridge engineer, and I know very many bridge engineers who are licensed in like 15, 16 states because they want to be able to design bridges all across the country, so they're licensed all over the place. It's very common for engineers to be licensed uh, in multiple states. Now, if you're going to be in a career where that's important, there's a couple things you need to keep in mind. Um, the first thing is about the EI application and the work experience. So um, remember, passing your FE and getting your EI certification are not the same thing. You pass your FE, and then you have to actually fill out the paperwork, apply to get that EI certificate. Okay? Now, you can't do that until you graduate, because in order to get your EI certification, you need two things. You need an FE pass under your belt, and you need a college degree. So you can't do that until after you graduate. My advice is do not wait to do this. Sometimes people let it slip and they're like, oh, I passed the exam, I can, you know, uh, register for it later, no big deal. No, do it the absolute first chance that you get. And here's why. The work clock in West Virginia starts the day you graduate, okay? So you all graduate in 2023, which means if you pass your FE, you'd be able to sit for your PE in 2027. So theoretically, in West Virginia, you wouldn't have to register for your EI until right before then. But let's say once you get your PE, you're like, nah, I, wanna, I need to get licensed in Pennsylvania. I need to get licensed in North Carolina, all these other states. Well, some of those other states might say, no, 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 no. The work clock began the day you got the EI, and they might make you wait another three years. Okay? So don't, don't do that. The first chance that you get to apply for that EI certification, certification again, they graduate, or the, once you graduate, once you get your FE under your belt, apply for it right then and there. It's really simple, but don't forget. Now, <clears throat> there's a, a, a process coming up, and it's starting to catch a, a, you know, some ground with some of the licensing boards, and the idea is, is this process called exam decoupling. West Virginia has yet to do this, but they may, um, they may um, uh, uh, pick this up. Here's what decoupling means. The traditional process is that you get your EI, work for four years, and then take your PE exam. Decoupling means you could take your PE exam before you get those four years of experience. You just take the two exams, writing succession, work for four years, and get your license. So the idea, so the, the, the driver's permit, or the driver's license analogy would be take your learner's exam, take your license exam, then get your driving experience, then get your driver's license. So it's it, it sort of decoupling that required experience from the exam. Um, some states are doing this, some states are not. Um, I, my recommendation is that you follow the standard process because if you want to get licensed in another state, they may not do this and then they may say you need to take the exam again. So I would just follow the standard process, wait four years, and then take the exam. If you don't believe me, if you look at the data on folks you know, taking the exam, people who pass the exam have the highest chance of passing right around four years. So if you wait till when you're supposed to take the exam, you have the best chance of passing the exam. So that would just sort of be my, my point on that. Now, in West Virginia, this goes to a question earlier, licenses are renewed every two years. So again, if you look up anybody in the state of West Virginia who's licensed, this is me, license number 23045, I expired December 31st, 2020. Everybody uh, who is on that, that same cycle, it ends you know, every even year. So once I renew again, it'll say December 31st, 2022. Um, in the state of West Virginia, you are required to get continuing education. So, so uh, the way that works is, um, once I get my license, I don't have to take the exams again, 
but the licensing board wants to make sure that I'm up to date with current practices in engineering. I mean, engineering is an evolving field. And so engineering in the 1970s wasn't the same as engineering today. And there are engineers who've been practicing since the 1970s. And we want to make sure that they're up to date and current. So every two years, we're required to get so much continuing education. In the state of West Virginia, we're required to accrue 30 hours every two years. Okay. Um, if you're in ASCE, we organize a technical conference on campus for engineers in the area to get their continuing ed here on campus. It serves as a fundraiser as well for our canoe and bridge uh, and whatnot. You also, you do have to pay your license renewal and it's really, really cheap. In West Virginia, it's $70. That's like $2.92 a month, so it's really cheap. It's not, it's not a money thing uh, at all. Um, okay. Uh, I have some advice at the end, uh, but I do want to ask if there's any questions. I do also want to talk about the FE exam. That's going to be the experience that you all have in the very near future. Does anybody have any quick questions? All right, let's talk about the FE because I think you need to know about that. So the FE is the exam that you all will take, which I suggest you take around your senior year. Okay? It's a computer-based exam, and it's administered at these Pearson View testing centers. If you drop a pen at Marshall University and you say, what is the nearest testing center to us? It's in Charleston, and I've got the address and contact info right here. Uh, by the way, again, all, all these slides are on Blackboard, so you all have all of this. The exam is 110 questions, okay, and it's split up into two sessions. So you start off, you file a non-disclosure agreement, and then there's like a tutorial that you go through to make sure that you're comfortable with the interface. And then you have, you know, like exam part one, a break, exam part two. Now during each of those parts, you can back and forth between questions, but once you finish part one, those, those questions are done. Once you finish part two, those questions are done. But during that, you can go back and forth. Now, <laughs> I know this is going to be kind of tiny, but um, again, I, I have this on Blackboard. I have here civil engineering, this is mechanical engineering, this is electrical and computer engineering, and this is other disciplines. Um, there are, I think, I think it's seven different tests. There's like chemical, civil, electrical, computer, mechanical, industrial, environmental, and then other for the FE exam. And so if, like, if you're a biomedical engineer, you'd probably want to take the other. But once you get to the PE, there's like 20 or 30 different exams for PE, and it gets much more specific towards your given industry. So <coughs> if you're in, let's say, civil engineering, these are the topics that the exam covers. And so many of, you know, if you look at some of these classes, these, these, these topic areas, we have classes. I mean, we have a class called transportation engineering. We have a class called structural analysis. So usually, um, like, I, I teach structural analysis. We cover what's on the exam and a whole lot more than that. If you can do what's, what you do in my class, you can certainly do what's on the exam. That, this is a fundamentals uh, exam. So on civil, we have math, problem stats, computational tools, that's like spreadsheets and whatnot, ethics, econ, statics, dynamics, mechanics of deformable bodies, materials, fluids, H&H, &H, structures, geotech, transportation, environmental. That's, that's the civil exam. Mechanical, um, I, I'll see this here. I'm not going to read all of them because I, I want to get, get through these. But here's mechanical. Some of the same topics are on multiple exams, but the emphasis changes. So for instance, mechanicals are concerned more with things moving, and civils are concerned, bless you, are concerned more with things sitting still. There's an old joke that mechanical engineers design weapons and civil engineers design targets. Um, if you look at, at the exam, that's, that's an old joke. Uh, if you look at the exam, like dynamics, there's only four to six questions for the civils, but for the mechanicals, there's like nine to 14 questions on dynamics because it's more important uh, to them. And if you look at electrical, there's all this stuff on circuits and, and stuff that isn't even on any of the other exams. So your exam is much more tailored to your specific field. So you don't have to go out of your emphasis area. Um, for electricals, there's a lot more different topics, but fewer questions in those topics. Uh, so you have things like on electromagnetics, control systems, communications, so on and so forth. Okay. <coughs> in general, I recommend that students take their FE during their senior year. Um, you're provided one attempt per testing window and no more than three attempts per 12-month period. Um, and so the testing window, I think that's within a couple months. Like you pay your fee and then you pick the, the date that works for you. 
Currently, the exam is $175. That might seem like a lot, but if you compare that to like a, a bar exam for attorneys or a board uh, exam for doctors and physicians, I mean, it, that's nothing compared to uh, some of the other, um, some of the other uh, uh, professions. You register and pay for the exam, you schedule the exam, and you receive your confirmation letter from Pearson View. Um, this is the website where you would register and pay for the exam. Again, you've got this link on Blackboard, so bless you. So I'm not going to, uh, every, everything's here. Um, exams are essentially offered year round. And the nice thing about it being computer based is you can take the exam and you'll find out your results in a week. They usually release the results on Wednesdays. So you'll find out immediately. Now, one thing that's a little interesting about the exam is you really don't bring much to it. You don't bring a pencil or anything. They provide that. You don't bring any paper. They provide that. What you can bring is make sure to bring your appointment letter that's stating that you can come. Bring an approved calculator. I'll talk about that here in a second. You do need to bring an ID. So you do need to bring your driver's license, uh, a passport, military ID, whatever makes sense, but an approved ID. And you can bring some like comfort items, like a sweater or something like that, uh, yeah, medical needs. When I took my PE exam, I brought earplugs, and I thought it was a, a wise decision because you, know, you don't want it to be noisy. I think it helps with con uh, 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 concentration. Do not bring a cell phone. If it was me, leave it in the car. Don't even mess with it. They, you don't even want to entertain the idea, or they, you don't want them to entertain the idea that you're cheating or anything. Uh, don't bring a pencil either. They provide all of that. You know, smart watches, don't bring any of that, you know, uh, just what's on the list. The calculator policy, the way that the calculator policy works, there are very, very specific calculators that they allow and everything else they do not. You could go to the dollar store and buy a really crappy calculator for one dollar that does less than what these do. But if it's not on the list, they're not going to let you use it. What's on the list? Well, they allow Casios. Anything that has an FX-115 and an FX-991 in the model name. Uh, Hewlett Packards, they allow two Hewlett Packards. And any Texas instruments with a TI-30X and a TI-36X. Anything else they forbid. So I'm, I was a TI-89 fan when I was an undergrad. Can't use it. Okay? I recommend these two calculators. They're very, very similar. And bang for your buck, I think that you get the most functionality out of these two calculators. It also might not be a bad idea to bring two calculators in case one craps out on you. You will be provided with a, sort of a booklet and a pen that you can, you know, it's like a reusable like dry erase type thing where you can do calculations. And there's also a reference handbook which can be downloaded for free on the NCES website. It has all sorts of formulas and equations. You really ought to consider downloading that. It is a wonderful resource for your entire engineering degree. Um, with that, I know I, I only got a minute or two, but that's basically it for, for my information on the exam. Does anybody have any general questions about the process overall? Because this is pretty important for everybody. Yes, sir? The what? Decoupling, yes. I believe Ohio decouples. I'm not sure about Kentucky, but I believe Ohio has decoupled. I, I don't recommend, though, that you go towards that process unless you are sure that you are only going to practice in Ohio for the rest of your life, and you aren't sure of that. Yeah, nobody's sure of that. Nobody can look in the crystal ball and see where they are 20 years from now. So I wouldn't do that unless you don't mind taking the exam again. Yeah. So. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, that's all I have for everybody. Um, you all have a wonderful weekend. Don't forget the quiz. See you all next Friday.